Morning, everything set up? All your environments all set up and everything? I believe I did send out the announcements of three days ago. Um, but no worries, now's the time to get it set up. Any issues here? No, I've just got too many windows, I've got to set it all. Okay. Okay, no problem. Uh, everybody here okay with the install instructions? The Windows users over here, you all okay? Yes. Okay, good. You guys here okay with the environments? Getting set up, okay. Uh, all here okay. People are okay with the environments? Okay, that's good. That's good, all right. One twenty one. Let's see. Uh, just check one last thing. Oh, just going to check in with the uh, helper at the door. Come on in. She knows. We'll do the uh, university time thing where we start five minutes after the clock. Uh, so we'll give some people, give people time to get their environment set up. One twenty-five will officially start. Okay. Yes, it does. Even at, so, MIT. I've been there. It. We do the five minute after thing. So classes are supposed to start officially at one. We start at one five, and we end five minutes before. It gives people ten minutes to walk from one side of campus to the other, and that sort of stuff. And then at UCSF, which I worked before, it was the same thing. We'd start five after. <laughs> that's California time. <laughs> okay, that's California time. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're not going to start, but I'm just going to quickly walk through a few things. Firstly, um, uh, some administrative stuff. That's all. So. First things first, uh, I want to thank Hugo for being here. Hugo's at the front there. Please wait to everybody. Uh, Hugo is going to help out with the tutorial today. Um, he's been very valuable in, so Hugo works with DataCamp, and DataCamp you know, makes courses on Python and data science and stuff. And he's been really helpful in having a pair of eyes, a seasoned educator pair of eyes, on looking at the material here. So big thanks to him. Next up, uh, if you haven't already, get your environments set up. For, for this, uh, I intentionally don't want to mess with your own environments, and so I have a conda install instruction or a virtual env install instruction. So git clone the repository to your local drive and follow those instructions. Windows users have been having some issues with the environment as well, so I heard a few success stories scattered around the place. Um, so Windows users, follow the instructions, but now you have to follow the same instructions Except now behind the hood, under the hood, sorry, you have a new environment specification file which should make things work. At the end, I will be giving you two surveys to do. And this is intentional because um, PyCon wants one survey for their own records, but I want some alternate feedback, alterna uh, an alternative set of feedback that will help me improve the material for future use. Right? So there are going to be two links, and I'll Reannounce them at the end as well. Finally, don't throw away the sticky notes on your table. Um, they were left from, left over from the previous tutorial, and uh, or if, there may not, may or may not be one at your exact seat, but there should be some scattered around. Uh, these indicate to Hugo and myself that I need help. I'm something's going wrong. I'm not sure what I'm doing. Whatever it is, uh, if you want to speak with us, stick your sticky note onto your laptop, and we will come by. Yeah, yeah, just shout at us. All right, so everybody set up? Good to go? Still downloading. still downloading. Okay, so for those of you who are still downloading in the process of setting things up, uh, for the time being, we can wait. You can, you'll probably have until the 15 minute mark in the tutorial uh, to have everything set up. And if at that point you're still downloading stuff, pair code with someone else. Um, all of the material is available on GitHub. Uh, freely available for everybody, so you don't have to worry about 
missing out. Okay, let's get started. Welcome everybody. This, is, this tutorial is gonna be on data testing practices for data science, all right? So underneath the hood, I'm sort of making a few assumptions of who you are. Um, if you fit those assumptions to the T, you're in the right place. If you sort of fit the assumptions that I'm making, you're still okay in the right place. And if you don't fit those assumptions, I hope something new comes out. I hope you learn something new from the tutorial anyways, all right? So I'm sort of imagining that you in the crowd, you are someone who's like a data analyst. You use Python to analyze data. Pandas is part of your toolkit. Matplotlib is part of your toolkit. You write custom code, and your, you know, your custom code is used to analyze your data. And so you don't have necessarily a software engineer's background, but you do know how to write functions and sort of stuff, that sort of stuff. So if you're a, if you're that type of person, then you are probably in the same position that I've been over the past three years, which is I get data, and I write my own code, and then three months later, I'm not exactly sure what I wrote um, because it's not documented. Number two, it's not tested. Number three, sometimes my data's corrupt, and I didn't really know until three days after analyzing it, right? And so there's, this is the type of person that I think you are. Um, and I have a bit more detail inside the readme file. So, if you want to use these notebooks outside of the tutorial, uh, you can do it this way. Uh, so, th this, is how, this is how this tutorial is gonna be structured. Let me, let me back up and say this first. This is how the tutorial is gonna be structured. Out of the three hours allotted to us, there's gonna be some break time and such, but we're only gonna use two hours for me sort of blabbering and talking, right? There's gonna be a, a long one hour stretch that's uh, so there's going to be live coding, a lot of like live coding and uh, interactive stuff where you get to code on your computers during that two-hour break, uh, two-hour uh, portion, and then the last hour is what we're going to is time for you to do some of the bonus notebooks. So I've structured this tutorial such that there's two notebooks, three sorry, three notebooks: the introduction one that I'm going through right now, the uh, PyTest introduction, and uh, T testing for your data, which I consider foundational and very important, mandatory, we should go through it in, in person. And then the other three notebooks that I've included are sort of stuff that you can explore on your own time during that one hour period or after the tutorial, right? And that's sort of slightly more advanced stuff. So if you wanna follow along um, with the notebooks, uh, that's totally cool. We're actually not going to use the notebooks very much for, for coding, because most of what we're gonna be doing lives inside the terminal and your favorite text editor, right? So testing and this sort of stuff, you can do a lot of prototyping in Jupyter, but when it actually comes to writing the tests, using, uh, writing the tests and using frameworks for automatically running the tests, you have to do it in the terminal, all right? Okay, so why do we need tests? I think this should be important, uh, sorry, this, this important, these few points are gonna be important and they should be something that you might have thought about before, all right? So whenever we write code and we, or, or whenever we get data, we make assumptions about them. And so tests, t writing other code that, is, that actually tests those assumptions of those code um, can help us see where our assumptions about our code and our data are violated. And so this, for this reason, automated testing, right, so if we go in and test them one by one, you might have a big code base and it's really tedious to do it manually, so automated testing is an important thing to have uh, in your toolkit for a data analyst. And so the way I look at tests is as such, they are a contract between your current self and your future self. They're also a contract maybe between your data provider and yourself being the data analyst. Um, Essentially, what, it's, what a test says is what I expect to be true now should hold to be true in the future. Whenever I write a f when I write my function, my first block of code that does something to my data, 
all the transformations to the data that uh, are encoded inside there, if I expect them to be correct today, they should be correct three months from now when I'm looking at my code again. When I look at my data file, it's of some state today, three months from now it should be the same thing. So what I expect to be right now should, be hold, should hold true in the future, and what I expect to be wrong now should still be wrong in the future. And so there's this element of stability implied, and this stability is implied unless, only one if, unless the requirements have changed. So when you write your code, when you get your data, you've got a, spe you, you've got a spec for what, what you're expecting in terms of requirements for the code and data. Only if the requirements have changed do your assumptions, uh, should your assumptions of your code and your data also change. All right, so I'm going to open the floor for a few minutes now. I want to ask you a few questions. Uh, what needs to be tested for your code? What do you think when, what do you think of when you say, when you hear the phrase, I need to write tests for my code? You can go popcorn style, sorry. Edge cases. Edge cases. Can you elaborate a little bit? Okay. Off by one, off, okay. Pardon me, really? Do, okay, so, uh, so edge cases are one important thing to test for our functions, perhaps. So I have some manipulation, and then I realize uh, I've got a division operator inside there. And so am I assuming stuff about zeros being in the denominator? We all know what happens when you divide by zero, right? The universe collapses into a black hole, right? Um, and then you've got at large, what happens when to your function uh, as you go to really large numbers, right? Is there some implicit limit uh, of uh, upper limit number that you're thinking of? Right? What else do you think of when you think about testing my code? Uh, I'll get to you there. What's this? Can you elaborate on that? Okay. So there's this element of correctness that's involved. What, uh, when, I, when I look at my code and I look at the inputs and the outputs, the outputs are expected given the, given the inputs. The outputs are correct given the inputs. Okay. Back there. Yes, exactly. Intent and correctness are very close concepts there. Um, I'll, I'll actually refer you guys to a talk by Itamar. I think it's going to be on Friday. It's on testing. He gives a very good high-level overview about, uh, about uh, this testing loop. And there's some stuff that's uh, automatable and stuff that's not. When we talk about correctness, correctness is the part of that loop that is not automatable. But stability... That means once we know what, that our requirements are correct and that the function has been implemented correctly, we want to guarantee it to be correct in the future. When we ask for stability, that's where automated testing comes in, and Itamar will give a very good introduction to that. What else do you think of when you think of uh, tests for code? Like dividing by zero. No, I'm just joking. Ah, yes, absolutely. Okay, so sometimes if you're... If you, uh, even the most experienced programmers might make the same mistake as well, where uh, accidentally we're spawning lots of processes and stuff, and so maybe we want to check that our system resources are not being overly consumed. Okay, good. What about for data? What do you think of when you think of the idea, I need to write tests for my data? Pardon me? Okay, do I, do I have all of the data that I'm expecting to see? Or do I have uh, a missing value located somewhere in that big data matrix? All right, so maybe I should write a test for that. Okay, what else is there? Data types. Data types. Can you elaborate? Um, so making sure that each column has um, the data type that I'm expecting it to, and I want to read it instead of like variations. Okay, so let's say, for example, we have a column that says date of birth, and you get something that uh, is. And, you, and in all of the rows, everything's good until you hit someone who goofed up and said, hello world, in their date of birth, because that's the word apparently that they said once they were born. Um, so that's going to be obviously something bad for this column, date of birth. What else do you think of when you think about tests for your data? So data types, we have missing data. Pardon me? The size of the data. Can you elaborate on that?
Oh, okay. Okay, got it, got it. That's a, that point is a little bit out of today's tutorial scope, but don't worry, it's an absolutely valid point. Uh, if you're going to use pandas for a three terabyte file, make sure you have seven terabytes of RAM, basically. All right, so that's, that's the sort of big idea, if you wanna do everything in memory, that is. So, right, so making sure you're picking the right tools. What else, so then what do you think about for when you think of, I have, I need to write tests for my data statistics. Wonder if you've ever thought about that question, or if you haven't, why don't you give it a bit of thought, talk with your neighbors, what about your data statistics might you want to test? Go. Oh, okay, so that's a little bit more advanced than I was thinking, but that's absolutely correct as well. When I'm constructing my statistical model, you know, if I'm, doing, if I'm going Bayes, which I fully advocate, um, uh, I want to check that my hyperparameters are specified with the correct ranges and that sort of stuff. So yes, that's one of them. Anything else? I think you had one over here. Yeah, I was thinking about uh, if you get such data that you need to model, you want to maintain certain thresholds on the classification, you decide to get rid of it. Okay, so some, some bounds, for example. Actually, the, so the, the data and the data stats sort of stuff that I'm thinking of are fairly overlapping, and so for example, one thing that you'd want to check both for your statistical analysis purposes and for data integrity purposes might be this thing about range, right? Your min and max values. Are they what you expect, right? So there, if you look at some data sets, there's the economic indicators data sets and they've got this rate column. And this rate column is always defined between zero and one and somebody put in there 98. They wanted to code 98% as 0 0.98 but they wrote 98 rather than 0 0.98 and so something is out of bounds. You should be raising an out of bounds error or something like that. Okay, those are the basic ideas. With code, essentially we're saying we need to test that from, for some given input, my outputs are what's, what are expected, and if I give counter examples, they should show up as incorrect, they should throw an error. Uh, if I, I should also be accounting for boundary cases using defensive programming as well, and that Ideally, all lines of stable code should be subject to at least one test inside your test suite, all right? For data, people have mentioned it already. We're talking about the data types. Uh, we're talking about data integrity. Uh, we're looking for completeness of the data and that we wanna make sure that the schema or the structure of the data is also complete. So if someone gives you a data file and they say you should have this set of columns in the schema that they've also provided but you find one column is missing, you should raise a red flag there, all right? And for statistics and say downstream machine learning purposes, we're thinking about, um, we're really thinking about things like, are my data following some underlying statistical distribution that I might be interested in? Um, and you know, are my data currently classified as categorical, ordinal, count, compositional, continuous, what is it, right? Because um, the tools, the statistical models that we'll write in the future uh, downstream, sorry, they depend on the type of data that we're putting in. And when we're talking about things that are non-numeric, so strings, categories, etc., they should always be converted to some numeric type before being put into machine learning algorithms because most machine learning algorithms at the, as they are implemented today require numbers and not strings, right? So basic things like this. Okay, those were, that was a great high-level discussion. Um, Here's what you can expect from today's tutorial. Like I was mentioning, there's the three notebooks that we'll go through live, in person, face to face. Um, and then there are, two, there are three more notebooks that I'll leave one hour time for you guys to explore on your own. Uh, and then uh, and there's one final notebook called Projects, which if you finish everything, that's a good way to sort of tie up all your knowledge. Or you can go back home uh, work through them as well, right? There's, there's, uh, those are the sort of more advanced stuff. Um, we'll be doing a lot of coding in your favorite text editor plus the terminal, and so I'll ask you to make files and stuff. The, for those files, there's an analogous underscore solutions.py file that if you ever get stuck, you can use those as a reference. So those files should already be inside your downloaded repo. This tutorial material will essentially be like this. Um, 
we'll cover all the stuff. We'll have some interspersed lectures in between. There's going to be simple exercises designed to get you familiar with how to write tests. And what I'm hoping to give you is a set of tools to code, tools and code to bootstrap testing for your next data project. Right? That's the big idea over here. Then, and that's the, the bonus material that I mentioned earlier. As in terms of take homes, this is what I'm hoping you'll take home from this tutorial. Firstly, a, lot, a ton of practice, if you've not already had it, with PyTest and assertion statements. The second one is self-paced learning material that you'll have on, on, uh, on, on hand to do things like property-based testing. Um, if you get to that notebook, uh, that will be something really good. Uh, and some tools for writing tests for your code and data. And most importantly, if there's anything, anything, anything that I want you to take home from this, it's go and write a test for something, for a line of code in your project, for something like your data, uh, for, for a data file. Um, and if that's all you take back, I consider this tutorial to be a success. That's the minimum baseline that I'm hoping you all will take home. So unlike, so some of you were in my, say, network analysis tutorial, and that one involves a lot of brain power. You have to think through problems and stuff. This one has much less of that and much more of like, let me just write that test. What other edge cases could I think of? And that's, that's sort of the scheme of this tutorial. OK, let's get started. So first part of this tutorial is going to be a PyTest introduction. How many of you have heard of PyTest? Okay, quite a bunch of people. And a bunch of people here have already, ha if you've heard of PyTest, have you also used PyTest? Fewer. Uh, so for those who've used PyTest, what were your use cases? Can I just hear that? Okay, big software engineering projects need tests. Okay, go on. What else? What other? What have other people used it in what contexts? So, writing unit tests for what kind of a project were you working on? Mapping software. Okay. 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 What else? Okay. Okay, so regression testing. Okay, okay. So checking that stuff that your, your NLP library was working fine. So PyTest is one of many testing frameworks that are out there. Uh, I remember when I was at a P Boston Python talk, uh, I was talking with Matt Bachman, who is also a Boston Pythonista, and he had, I was telling him, oh, this tutorial is going to be based on PyTest, and the guy to my left looked at me and said, one word, nose. So nose test is another testing library. And people sometimes can get into real deep philosophical fights about, I, need, I should use this testing library, or you should use that testing library. It's sort of like the fights you get into with Django and Flask, or frequentism and Bayesianism. Um, we're not going to get into any of those fights today. We're just going to show you how to use PyTest. If you're happy to use another testing framework, that's your prerogative. All props to you. The PyTest framework makes it easy to write small tests, but it also scales to support large, complex uh, functional testing for applications and libraries. And if you think about it, most data projects, 80% of what you'll see for an analytics and stuff probably belongs to that realm of smaller scale stuff. Right? And so that's, uh, that's sort of what I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of like, the kind of data you'll, you'll want to be testing. So, for those of you who haven't seen PyTest, essentially this is how PyTest works. You have your .py file, and in it you've got functions that operate on your data. You then create a separate test underscore something .py file, and in it you write all of your tests. And all of those tests are prefixed with a test underscore something, and for human readability, what you might do is say test underscore function. So if you have a function name f, you would say test underscore f so that you know this test matches back to that other test. Or you can, you can name your functions in another way. Those also work. So all tests are prefixed with a test underscore prefix. All files have the test underscore prefix, so all test, under, test files. And this is basically a, a good way of making testing easy for humans to understand. So we're going to embark on a 
simple example. And most of the examples, by the way, that we're going to use over here, they're not going to be complicated examples. They're going to be simple functions, but we're going to test them. All right? So I'm going to do a toy example with you. Uh, we're going to implement an increment function. And in, inside this increment function, uh, sorry, we're going to implement this increment function, and we're going to test it. So what I would like you to do is go to your text editor, go to your terminal text editor, whatever it is, Create a Python module inside the GitHub repository called datafunks.py. And inside, write a function name increment, and in, which increments, which takes an input x and increments it by 1. Right? This is a trivial function, but we're going to write tests. We're going to write a test for this to uh, demonstrate how to do it. So I'm going to live code this myself as well. So let me bring this over. I'm going to do this with you guys so I can pace myself. Try again. Okay. Data funks.py, and that is the file above. You can ignore my flake eight errors. I'm going to move this up to here, behind there, so it's not interfering. We'll implement a function called increment. Uh, let me disable flake 8. Uh, I don't know why it's still running. Wow. Getting all sorts of errors. You know what? I'm going to switch over to nano. Okay, so everybody should have something like this implemented inside your function, right? Not too difficult of a, of a thing. So I'm going to exit out of that, make sure data funks is inside there, uh, data funks shows the right thing. Let me go back to notebook number two. So we're going to write then. So this is this is this data funks.py is that function file that I was mentioning earlier on that contains all the functions that you're going to write for your data analysis project. So we're going to now create a new file called test underscore data funks.py, and that's going to keep all of the tests for the functions that you've implemented in data funks.py. So go ahead, create that file, and we're going to write a test for the increment x function. And so I'd like you all to implement the, the following test inside there. We first import data funks into our uh, test file. We then write the function test underscore increment but we don't pass in any arguments at this moment. It's just a function we're going to execute. And then let's put the assertion statement here. Assert dfn.increment2 not equals to 3. I see a lot of frowning faces. What's going on? Your internal testing, your internal pi.test has already caught an error over here. But what I want to show you is what will happen if you implement the wrong test or if one of your tests fails first before I show you what will happen with a correct test. All right? So write that assertion statement inside the function. And if you're done, give me a thumbs up. OK, I'm going to wait 30 seconds more for the rest of the crowd to catch up.
your test data funks function, uh, test data funks.py file should look something like this. All right, so the 30 seconds are over. Now what I want you to do is execute the following command, pi.test, inside your terminal. All right? I forgot to do this, source activate data test. Move test this solution of pi. you should see something that looks like this inside your window. Thumbs up if you see that. All right, no? Okay, Part installing, okay. What happened behind over there? Uh, did you call it, make sure you're importing the correct.py file. So the file name has to be correct. All right, people see that. Okay, so. This is what you'll see if you see a test that fails, and this is what you want to be on the lookout for. Every time you write tests, you want to make sure your test cases uh, don't fail. If they fail, then you know something went wrong. So when you wrote that assertion statement, you knew inside your head, increment two should equal to three. So that's sort of a trivial case. But let's imagine now you're in the situation where, huh, I'm not exactly sure where my implementation went wrong. This, what you're seeing on the screen here, will help you narrow down where that went wrong. So, firstly, what PyTest will show is the exact function, the function that went incorrect. So that's this, this guy over here, all right? Def in test increment. That's the test function that went wrong. Then it'll pinpoint the exact line that went wrong. Then, after that, it'll pinpoint why that line went wrong. So, in this case, assert three not equals to three is where the error showed up. It'll provide additional information as well, where this thing on the, uh, this thing on the left, three equals uh, function increment at blah, 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 that's the memory location of that guy, passing in two is where this, this three on the left is equal to this function acting on function two, on the input two, and this function, this function call that it's referring to in memory is dfn.increment, datafunks.increment, right? So that's what you'll observe. And at the end, it'll also tell you, okay, there was an assertion error. All right, in addition to that, there are a few clues as to what's going to happen, what uh, sorry, there are a few clues as to uh, why this also, sorry, there's a few clues that will tell you, oh, in my test suite, let's say I had more than just one test implemented inside here. It'll tell you, okay, this file had some errors, that file didn't have some errors. If you have seven tests and they all pass, you won't see an F here, you'll see a dot, 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 seven times, dot, 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 right? So you'll see seven dots. And the dot where it's now an F is the function that it failed, and the, that's the, that's the uh, diagnostic. The bottom part on the screen is the diagnostic for that. Okay. So, congratulations. You've written a test, and it failed. And this is exactly what you're supposed to be looking out for. So now what I'd like you to do is go and fix the problem. You know where to fix the problem. So go ahead, fix the problem. Uh, and I'll do this live with you as well. So fix the problem and then run pi.test one more time. Thanks, Hugo. Okay, uh, thanks to Hugo, he caught, uh, very sharply caught another thing. Oh, Hugo, there's an issue at the back. Uh, the stuff that you've downloaded, the repo that you downloaded, also already contains my solutions. So it'll be running all of my tests at the same time. 
So what I would like you to do is to rename test underscore solutions to something that doesn't have the prefix test. You can add an A before that, and that will work as well. Right? So rename that file, and then suddenly all of those tests won't be run. Or you can actually, pardon me? That's true. That's right. You can do pi.test, I think test underscore datafunks.py, and it will run just that one. So I fixed the test, and you should see something that looks like this. Essentially, where you see green on your terminal output, it's a good sign. Right? So this is what your screen will look like if pi.test finishes running. OK, I sort of already explained it once. But if any of you are still confused about what this magic command pi.test is doing, this is what it's doing. It's recursively looking for all test underscore files, uh, test underscore something dot pi. And then it'll execute each of those functions that are inside there and make sure, and it'll check the assertion statements that are inside there. And if anything throws an error, it'll mark it as a failure. And if anything doesn't throw a failure, it'll mark it as a success. Basically, it's testing for humans, because it's very easy for us to cognitively remember, oh, I got a function. I should write test underscore function in that test underscore something dot pi file. All right? Is everybody clear with what we've said so far? Uh, can I see thumbs up if you're OK with this? OK, good. Sounded kind of elementary. So now, what I'd like you to do is do one other thing, which is go accidentally change your function definition. You've corrected the test. The test now writes what you expect to see. Given an input, that output should be correct. Now go break the function, because this is going to simulate what happens if suddenly the requirements changed sort of, kind of temporarily in your head. You modified the function to do something new, but then you realize, oh, crap, my tests don't work. I didn't actually mean to change the requirements. Now you can figure out how to pinpoint that. So go ahead, change, break the function, run pi.test, get the error, see, and then go fix the error. All right? So don't want to take too much time for this. Spend the next two minutes doing that, and that should be it. The solution is also broken? Oh, something inside there has, OK, move the solution.py file outside of the directory. That will be, I think, the. Uh, cleanest way to do that. So move this test solution file outside of the GitHub repo directory. And I'll note this for future iterations. Or do it in a subdirectory. That works too. All right, so roughly close to two minutes. People okay with this? Thumbs up if you're done. You've broken the function, and you've fixed the function back. All right, let's very quickly revise what the anatomy of a test looks like. The anatomy of a test is essentially this. You've got your test underscore file. You want to at least do one thing, which is write the correctness test. Write the test such that you have a given some input the correct values out there. You may also want to check with a counterexample that says, given some input, some incorrect value should throw me an error. All right? Or sorry, given an input, it should not equal this incorrect output. That's an, it's another thing you, should, you might want to do. The keys really lie in the assertion statements. And so that's what you're going to want to get used to writing for all of your tests. OK. All right. So how does testing actually work in practice? Testing works like this. You have a function that you know you want to implement. And what you do is you write the test for the function first, such that you don't accidentally later on re-implement the function inside your test. Right? So if you implement some complicated thing, It'll be very tempting to re-implement the 
something that looks very similar to the original implementation inside the test function. You don't want to do that. You actually want to start first with, I want my function to do, do, this, do this thing such that if I give it this input, it should give me that output. So you write those input-output statements first, then you put the test aside, you go and write the function, you execute PyTest, and check that everything is correct. Right? And you keep doing this over and over and over. In the software development world, this is called test-driven development. Right? You write the test before you write the function. I don't want to be dogmatic about it, but I think it's good practice because I've fallen into the trap myself of, oh, I've got this complicated string manipulating thing, and I want to test whether it's correct. And then when I write, so I wrote my function already, and then I went to write the test, and I found out, oh, my, wait, I can't, find a, I can't think of another way to write the test for correctness because I'm already inside the implementation details at the moment. So it's a very good idea, practically speaking, to write the test first so that you don't get stuck in the implementation details and accidentally re-implement the function inside the test function. All right? So I want to emphasize there's nothing complex behind this. 80% of what you'll be doing for your testing will follow this very simple loop, right? OK, what I want you to try now is take a look at the following exercise. There's a common data manipulation thing that you can import from scikit-learn, but I think it's a very good opportunity to use the same function, the min-max scalar, uh, to, to learn about testing, because there's some neat edge cases that, sh that show up. For the moment, what I want you to try is do this. Try, try is this. I want you to implement in datafunks.py a function called minmax scalar. It accepts one input x. It should take that x should be a numpy array, and it should scale all of the values to be between 0 and 1 inclusive. The minimum value should be set to 0. The maximum value of that array should be set to 1. So start first by writing a test for the minmax scalar in your test functs.py. Then go and implement the test, uh, implement the minmax scalar. And then after that, uh, run your tests to make sure they, they are fine. All right? So go do that. Five minutes. If at the moment you're thinking about edge cases and the likes, good for you. But I don't want you to implement the edge case tests just yet. You can assume some reasonable type of input. If you're squinting and you want to look at the, and you can't feel like you can't look at the notebooks on the screen, feel free to open the notebooks locally. Totally no problem as well. I believe inside the docs folder, there are HTML, static HTML versions of the notebooks as well, which you can take a look at. How many of you have finished implementing the test? Can I just see a quick show of thumbs? OK, everybody's good. In the, in the test mindset. Very good. Oops. 
I'm also going to implement this locally. Okay, how many people are done with this exercise? Show of thumbs. Okay, got a few people. If you have something reasonable in the test function, consider it done, and then move on to the implementation. And by reasonable, I'm thinking something along the lines of this, where I have, say, at least one line of test, one line of assertion statements. You can include a few more if you so choose to. We'll give people two more minutes. Actually, that'd be a good thing to show. That'd be a good thing to show. Yeah. I forgot to import NumPy. We'll move on it. We'll run through this example at 210, all right? For those of you who are done and feeling a little bored, feel free to go into the docs folder and open up the HTML versions of the notebooks. You can take a look at them, move on to the next few exercises. Totally no problem. Okay, so it's 2.10, and I have the minmax scalar test implemented over here. Uh, so I don't know, what, what are some people's implementations? I'm just sort of curious. Can you talk us through roughly what you've done? Any volunteers? Zero and one, okay, good. That's actually a better version of what I'm showing up here. This is sort of like the trivial version. So my, my version over here is 
I know I have an array that begins with one, two, and three, sorry, that has the values only one, two, and three inside there. And so if I transform that array to be between zero and one, the minimum should be zero, the maximum should be one, and it should have uh, 0 0.5 as the middle array. So we can call this, this guy over here, we can call, sorry, let me just, let me just show this. These three lines that I'm highlighting, I guess in some ways you could call that uh, an exact kind of a test, right? Uh, I know I have an exact input and I have an expected exact output, right? And so the random NumPy random array uh, is less exact, so to speak, in that you're not exactly sure what the inputs are gonna be, but one thing that's really cool about that kind of thing is you can, instead of testing that the values follow some exact distribution, instead you can do uh, you can test the properties of that new transformed array, such that the min is supposed to be zero and the max is supposed to be one, all right? If you, this, so this was sort of a preview for the notebook on hypothesis, which is about property-based testing. This test that I'm highlighting down here on the screen, where we assert that the minimum is zero and the maximum is equal to one, it's not an exact kind of a test, right? It's an, it's a, it's, we're testing a property of the array. The property is the minimum value and the maximum value. And in the case where you're generating large, num large arrays, you can't manually test exactly each value is correct, or in the case where you're dealing with random numbers, right, and you can't test that, you, you, you're unable to test that every value is a particular thing, because by definition it's generated randomly, then you can test instead the properties of that array. All right, so that's the function for testing, so I'll write that to disk, and then after that, I'm just gonna copy over my min-max scalar implementation. Ooh. What do you think? What is correct? What is correct is what's required by you, and sometimes what required by you is what you've determined to be correct. So you're allowed to define what happens with that. That's a good edge case, right? So let me, sorry, let me just fix this a little bit. Okay, so I've got my data funks, I've, sorry, I've got my implementation of, I've got my implementation of the min-max scalar I broke the requirements over here, in which I said if it has, it's an iter or it's, and it's not a NumPy array, it's probably castable to a NumPy array. Technically speaking, this should not be there. But this is a good example of, oh, my requirements has changed. I don't want to only input NumPy arrays, right? Because if I, if I provided a list inside this current implementation, which has the checks for whether it's an iterable commented out, if I did this, just returned this line over here, which I'm highlighting, if I passed in a tuple or a list, it's gonna error out, because the list doesn't have a dot min attribute, it doesn't have a dot max attribute either, all right? But that's, that's another thing, so that's the implementation. And we can run pi.test, so pi.test. Let's see what happens. I forgot to import numpy. Ah, okay. You'll see that PyTest can catch all of these errors as well. So I added NumPy to the test data funks file. Let's run pi.test. Ah, this is something, do people get this same error? if they do that. Yeah. All right, what's the right fix for this? Do people know? I actually know it already, but I wanna see if someone else who might have the answer. That's one way to do it, that's right. Uh, I have another way of doing it, so you can let, give that a shot, try that. Um, see if that works. I'm gonna do this. Yes, that's right, that's right. So we can do another thing called np.allclose transformed 
comma np.array, that guy. What np.allclose does is it tests element-wise that each value is within some very small tolerance. So it's good for stuff, say, if you're computing gradients or that sort of thing, uh, and you're doing some approximations or that sort of stuff, um, np.allclose is a fairly useful function to, to use. So we do that. Let's close that and put that there. And having fixed that, now we have all two tests passing. Remember, we fixed the first one. So that test is already encoded in this first dot. And the second test is encoded in the second dot, or coded, sorry, displayed as passing in our second dot. OK. Yes? Ah, yes. Let me, let me go through that more one more time. Uh, as Hugo was mentioning, actually, Hugo, you might want to elaborate on that. Or some, yeah, something like that. Or something like that. Okay, okay, right, right. So with Python objects, with raw Python objects, if I have two lists, I want to test whether they're equal in terms of both composition and order. I can ask, is one, two, three double equal to one, two, three? All right, I can do that. That's, I think, not a problem. Yeah, no, it works within the It works. Okay, I, I think there's a raised hand here. So you use array dot any array dot all. Okay. The I guess the, the question I was wondering about is some of the earlier uh, Python sets uh, frameworks like Node and yep. other stuff, they had helper uh, functions like assert array as equal, that kind of thing. Does, um, Does PyTest have this? Have to the best of my knowledge, no. And if I'm wrong, I'll update that on the GitHub notebooks. All right? So I'll, I'll note that down actually as something to check. For simplicity purposes, is that correct? Probably is. That, prob that makes sense as well from the philosoph philosophy of PyTest. All right. Either way, we can take care of the array equality by using np to all close, and it'll return true if it's all close within some tolerance. OK, so that was the error that, uh, that we fixed. All right. Is there uh, any other questions about this particular example so far? Exactly. It counts as one test, even though I have three assert statements. Now, I'll do a little side, uh, side journey here. How do you structure your tests? Do I keep all of my tests in one function, or do I have multiple different types of tests? My answer is go with what makes sense for the complexity of your project. In this particular case, this level of complexity is so simple, we can encapsulate everything in one test. It's not really necessary to break out the function into two things. Let's say, however, we had a more complicated function. There are a bunch of different cases. Well, then our test function might get, grow to be 20 lines long. We may want to categorize certain lines of tests and break them out into two functions, all right? We'd be very practical about how we're doing it. Do what makes sense for the scale of the project that you're working on. OK. So people had already thought of a few edge cases to the min-max scalar. What were they again? I think there was one from this side. So if you had only one element in array, does it make sense to do a min-max scalar? What are people's opinions? No, and the reason is because? That's right, there should be, a, so, okay, good. So one edge case is we pass in a single element inside that array, 
Okay, and it doesn't make sense for, or commonsensically, it wouldn't make sense if we had a single array passing and we wanted to know how to scale it between zero and one because we need a range of values. And so this range requirement actually necessitates that our array should at least have two values, right? It should have, a, it ha should have two values. What's another edge case that can show up? Duplicates. Sorry? For a two element array or for a large array? How so? Okay, all right, okay. So the, another edge case is here is you have two values or you have your minimum value repeated somewhere else in the array or the max value repeated somewhere else in the array, okay? What else is another big edge case? So you have two, oh, the minimum value of the array equals to the max value of the array and so you'll end up with a divide by zero error. And so the min-max scalar also doesn't make sense for the case that you have only a single value inside there. Okay. Why don't you try and think up, uh, try and write, oh, sorry, let me, let me pass in one more thing. I can also pass in an empty array, and that will cause the function to fail, right? So, because by definition, there's no numbers, so there's no range. All right, so why don't you try uh, implementing the implementing test cases for these uh, for these following edge cases. So first off, you pass in uh, you pass in an empty array. Secondly, you pass in array with only a single value. Thirdly, you pass in an array with all identical numbers. All right, so it only has a single value inside that array. It's a repeated array of say twos or ones. So go write test cases for that, and we'll check and discuss with each other on at, after another, let's do it for another five minutes. Ah, there's a question out here. Right, so, um, oh, did I forget to, I think I forgot to give you a bit, uh, I think I forgot, sorry, just give me one moment. I think I forgot to give you a bit of information that you might need to be able to do this. Thanks for the catch. Okay, so you need to know, so y you now have three edge cases where you know the function ought to fail, right? It ought to fail if you have Say, if you, pass in a not, if you pass in an empty list or an empty array, or if you pass in like a, an array with only a single number. So the way to test that pi, the way to test that something ought to fail, a given input ought to fail, is you encapsulate you encapsulate the function call inside a with pi test dot raises some part, some particular error, all right? So if you write, let me zoom in. If you type inside your test function with pytest.raises, say attribute error, if you pass in a list, it should give you an error, an attribute error, it should fail. If you pass in an integer, it should fail. If you pass in an empty list, it should fail. And if you pass, but because we're checking for attribute errors, we may not necessarily catch with the attribute error the case where we input a single uh, array that's a, a single valued array, all right? So this is how you can get PyTest to check that these are the counterexamples, these are the places that should fail because I don't want people inputting lists, single valued arrays and that sort of stuff into my function.
Okay, so with that, we can then go on to write the uh, we can then go on to write the uh, the corresponding defensive programming checks inside our min-max scalar function. All right, we've tested with the tests. We're asserting that the inputs uh, with these tests. We're asserting that the inputs should not be of this integer, empty list, or uh, integer or list list type. So that means we can go back and encode our assumptions about what the inputs should be by writing a bunch of assertion statements uh, back inside, back inside the test. Uh, sorry, inside the min-max scalar function. All right. So I'd like you to go and do that. Check inside your min-max scalar with your assertion statements that the inputs are what you are expecting it to be. So it should be a NumPy array. There should not be more than one value. Uh, sorry, there should be more than one value. It should not be an empty array and all of that stuff. So go write that. Spend the next five minutes writing that. And I will update that on my test on my datafunks.py. How are people doing with this exercise? Have you added at least two defensive checks? One that you're checking that it should be a NumPy array, and the other that you're checking that the length of this, the number of unique values in this array should be greater than one. How many people have done that? Show thumbs. Okay, we'll give people a bit more time for this.
quick show of thumbs, how many people are done with uh, at least these two tests? Okay. Give people one more minute, and what I guess we can do is this. Um, if you haven't finished implementing the test, that's not a problem. I'll talk you through the lines that I've written, and you can copy these into your function, into your test, into your min-max scalar function, okay? All right, so we mentioned earlier on that there were a few edge cases, and, if we th and those edge cases were uh, we input a list, an empty array, empty list, something that's not a NumPy array, and that we input something that has only one value, one unique value inside there, right? So if you think about that first case, we can actually, rather than saying assert that, uh, so what, sorry, to take care of the case where we're getting an incorrect type of data that we're putting in, we can actually check that the type of the data that we have is what we're expecting to work with. So in this case, the assertion statement is assert, we use the in, is instance function. The is instance function takes two inputs. The first input is the object that we want to check the type of. The second parameter to this is, is, is instance function is the type of the object that we're expecting. All right? So, for example, if I wanted to check that x was a list, then I can say is assert is instance x comma list. If I want to check that it's a tuple, assert is instance x comma tuple. Likewise, over here, I can say assert is instance np.array without the parentheses, because np.array is the type of that, of that, uh, that is a type that is valid in the NumPy library, all right? In addition to that, you'll notice after the assert statement, I inserted a string in quotation marks, and that's basically a message to the user of this function. X should be a NumPy array, and what will show up if I call this function without using, without passing in X as a NumPy array is it'll say assertion error, x should be a NumPy array. And that's a message to the user of the function, which is basically myself three months from now, I should be putting in a NumPy array here. So that covers the case of checking the type of the data. And then there's another case over here where we have uh, the, the number of unique values inside that array should be greater than one, should be two or more, all right? So what we can do is we can cast, oh, sorry, set x, not array. We can cast x as a set, and that will grab all of the unique values from the array, and we check that the length of the set is greater than 1. Sets can only have discrete number uh, sizes, therefore, if it's greater than 1, it's greater than or equal to 2. You can write them both ways. And again, if that condition is not fulfilled, then we, we would say x should have, we'd report to the user, x should have more than one unique values. And that will tell the users, uh, user of this function a, a very informative message, hey, maybe I've got something wrong with my inputs, right? Because the person who designed the function, myself three months ago, is telling me now, three months later, you forgot to make sure that your array has more than one unique value, all right? This is the way we write defensive programming checks that help inform the end user of this function that they need to have the correct inputs, right? This idea is sort of clear here? Yes, so you're, so you're using assert in the actual production code. As well. If you have this assertion statement, then it will, if the condition fails in the assertion statement, it will always raise uh, an assertion error. If you want to raise a different type of error, um, I'm blanking on how that works right now, but it is possible. Does anybody have know how to do this? Or, okay. Okay, yep, yep, something like that. All right, so that's, that's, that's the way. Yes, absolutely.
That's right. Now we can change this to assertion error. All right. So we've got the test that we've written and the corresponding, um, and the corresponding. Uh, so without writing the defensive programming statements, I would have to put attribute error because the function would yield an attribute error if I tried to put in uh, um, a list or whatever because it would be calling min dot min and dot max. You know what? I should demo this. I should demo this. And you guys can follow along if you'd like to as well, right? So we have pytest attribute error, right? It raises an attribute error if we try to put in, um, if we try to put this inside a, uh, if we try to input a list or an integer. I'm going to go to the IPython shell. That should be more visible now. Yep. I have my array, which is right now a list, not a NumPy array. Oh, I have my other things defined there. Sorry, just give me a moment. Without the assertion statements, it should be going x minus x dot min. So if x is a list, it will try to find the dot min thing and it will give an attribute error, right? Let's double check that. There we go. I passed in a list to the function min max scalar and it raised an attribute error. Without the defensive programming checks, I would have to use the with pytest.raises attribute error, and that, that's why we're catching the attribute error inside the pytest. That's right, I wouldn't. That's right. So I can do that. Okay, so array r is an empty array. And we get a value error instead. So we'll have to use with pytest.raises value error. Now, in the a priori, we might not know all these error types that we're supposed to look for. What's a good way to do it to, to find out? Well, we test them manually inside here. Or we raise, a, OK, we can do a raise a general exception instead. But I think it's always a bit better to be explicit about the type of error we're expecting to see, right? So we might say, let's raise a val we expect to see a value error if we put in an empty array. We can do that and code that test. But now that we have the defensive programming checks. It seems like that way you're pulling in known bugs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're. What do you mean by bugs that we want to fix, though? I'm not sure I'd want to input a NumPy array that's empty, though. So I'd want to make sure that my, you know, you know what I mean? Like, so it's, so putting a, so defining the function such that we input a NumPy array that's empty is not, uh, is a, is telling the user the, well, that's our fault for telling the user the wrong thing. We're not telling them we need to put in something that's, that's, that's greater than, you know, two unique values inside there. Gives a type error. Oh, really? Ah, uh, yep. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it, it raises a type error if 
That one I'm not too sure of, because rarely do I have to get to that level of, in my own work at least, rarely do I have to get to that level of complexity. I'll record that down and update the material for you guys. So what happens when we say, so in this case you had like a NumPy array of strings of sorts, right? And then yet we had the, was it attribute or assertion error? I think it's an attribute error, right? Or we change to assertion error, pytest.raises assertion error, and yet it catches type error as well. Okay, that's a bit more complicated than what I'm trying to convey today. Um, so I'll, but I'll take note of that and put that on the GitHub repo notebooks. Okay? In the test function. No, we've encoded that inside the assertion statement, the defensive programming check inside the minmax scalar function, the function definition. Okay. Okay. All right? No? This is what's up there at the moment, okay? All right. Uh, what makes me really happy right now, I'll, I'll get to you. What, get, what makes me really happy right now is people are thinking about all these other weird cases, and that's exactly the sort of thinking process you should be having when you think about tests. Pardon me? I'm just We get a type error over here, and that's also the same error that is, that's also the same error, uh, or rather that's the same class of type of issue as the late young lady over there was talking about. It's a bit more nested. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back, update the material with this particular test case. This was sort of a test case I designed on the fly. It's not something that I had anticipated on, on the spot, but it's a good thing to figure out. I'm going to update the material for you guys, all right? So let's, let's, um, let's move on from the min-max scalar case. I think people are in that mindset and in that zone already. So I want you to just get a bit more practice with one more thing, one more function. And this time, I'm not going to prescribe uh, an absolutely correct thing, but I want you to be able to go through the, the thought process yourself. So what I want you to try now is a different function that, has, that works on text type of data, string data. All right? And so you have two functions, two functions that I want you to implement. They are bag of words and strip punctuation. Right, so bag of words basically takes that long string and tokenizes it into its set of constituent words. And strip punctuation removes all punctuation from the text. All right, so I'd, what I'd like you to try to do is first design the test and then go on and implement the function. And then we'll have a very short discussion about what you implemented and maybe we can also compare it against, say, stuff that I've, looked, that I've, I've implemented. Right, so let's spend another five, ten minutes on this exercise.
And it, at the moment, if you're feeling brain fried from morning tutorials and all the discussion and that stuff, I believe Hugo has indicated there's coffee outside. Yeah. So please feel free. If, you're, if you'd like to get some refreshments and stuff, and then come back with the exercise, no problem. We'll resume all the discussion and everything at 3 p.m. Um, make sure you've also sort of have something for your tests and your code by then.
Okay, we're back. Um, most people should be back as well. All right, how many, uh, I'm gonna give you all a bit more time to finish off the string manipulation functions. Don't think about it too complicated in this case. Uh, implement the tests for the most obvious cases and not sort of the edge cases, and that's good enough. I just wanted you to have a feel of the testing loop where you write the test first and then you write the function. That's the main point of this exercise. So spend another three minutes or so, and we'll come back at 3.07 and uh, have a very, very, very brief discussion about what you implemented and what kind of tests you implemented. And for those of you who just came back, um, I was mentioning that I tried to encourage you to do this throughout. There's the HTML versions of the notebooks. So in case you miss the exercise prompt and you want to know what exactly am I implementing, uh, you can double check it against uh, the HTML versions of the notebooks. They're available in the docs folder. How many people are done? Can I just show, have a quick show of thumbs? Raise them high. Okay, we'll give people just a little bit more time for that, yeah. additional two minutes. For those of you who are done, feel free to go ahead to notebook number three and move ahead and start looking through the material on data checks.
all right? Back in time, I think. <laughs> all right, how are people doing with this, this exercise? Okay. I'd like to hear from someone who hasn't raised their hands and answered questions that I've been asking. What did you all implement in terms of the test, in terms of the function? Anybody? No volunteers? Okay, let's expand it to everybody. What did people implement? Okay, good, all right, so great, that's awesome. So you have two exact tests, so to speak, right? You provide a specific example and should give back a specific type of output. Anybody else? Yes. So the question was, uh, giving exact tests, is this sort of like a good thing and we shouldn't try to complicate life beyond doing just exact tests? My, uh, I think my response would be, again, be pragmatic about it. If you know, you know, sensibly speaking, you won't be getting, say you're accepting form from a web, form data from a web website um, and you know, you, most of the users probably aren't those who will insert SQL commands into their form responses, um, then yeah, probably that's reasonable. Now, that, I guess it sort of also depends on, you know, pragmatically speaking, how big are the consequences if you didn't test for those sort of edge cases, right? So yeah, um, be pragmatic about it with respect to the requirements of the, of the project, which is, I think, gonna be my most common answer to most how complicated should we go kind of questions. Um, as a matter of good practice though, exact tests should be the starting point uh, for most things, I think. And then you'd probably wanna try one or two property-based tests. And later on when you ha we have the independent hour of exploration, you might wanna try out the notebook on hypothesis, all right, which would be property-based testing. Okay, all right, so I'll just very quickly show you like the simplest naive thing that you can try. For strip punctuation, I would do basically yes, an exact test, and I'd assert that the set of letters inside my string T after being stripped of punctuation should not be, uh, should be a, a disjoint set from the punctuation set of things, the, uh, the set of letters, characters inside string.punctuation. One approach, you can try another one. And then for a bag of words, I have, you know, I'm not worrying about punctuations inside there. It's an exact test. So again, I have random stuff typed into this text line line. And so I'm actually checking for that. I'm also removing duplicate entries of words from this exact example. And so I know what the input is. I know what the out should be, output should be. I know that there should be no spaces inside there. I know that there should be only seven words in, that are output. This is sort of like the simplest kind of test that you can write. And if anything, if you at least write an exact test, you've got that thing covered for some small subset of things that could possibly go wrong. And that's better than having no tests at all, all right? And then the string function, string manipulation function implementations would look something like that. Uh, I basically have a very simple join, string.join if it's not in strong string punctuation, and that's the implementation that I've got after having thought through the test. Um, and bag of words is 
the set of words after splitting by spaces. Right? So that's another implementation that, and, and you know, we could probably go much more complicated if we're doing with multiple different types of languages, different character sets and that sort of stuff. But if, we're, if, if and only if the requirements were broader than just English. English ASCII characters on computers, all right? Don't want to belabor like the requirements as much as the testing loop. You've written the, the test first, then the function, and then you run PyTest check for correctness, and if something goes wrong, you go back and go through the loop again. You check your test, check your function, or pinpoint where it goes wrong. If the requirements change, write the test first, then write the function, modify the function, all right? That's basically the testing loop. Okay, with that, we're gonna move on to notebook three. Notebook three is about data checks. And so in the data checks notebook, we're going to, uh, part of it is going to be, uh, part of it is going to involve potentially some uh, exploration of data, and that portion is stuff that I'm going to demo for you. That's towards the latter half of the notebook. The first half of the notebook still involves some uh, hands-on writing of stuff, but then in this case, you would need to know a bit of pandas. And if you, don't know, uh, if you don't know a lot of pandas, don't worry, I'll have the code up on the screen so you can follow along as well. So I'd like you to open up, oops, I'd like you to open up the HTML docs that correspond to notebook number three, which are on data checks. All right, so when we talk about data checks, we're really talking about that data matrix that you're gonna get. What I'm assuming here is this scenario where you have the role of the data analyst and the role of the data provider. Someone is giving you the data, that person is the data. If someone's giving you the data, that person's the data provider. If someone is gonna analyze the data, then that person's the data analyst. And sometimes they're the same person. Sometimes they're not the same person. Regardless, there are a few things that I think should be checked for. Firstly, if you're being provided with a data matrix where you, each row is one sample and you have a bunch of data attached with that sample, then at the minimum, you should be checking to make sure that your columns of data that you've got are what you expect from, to, uh, sorry, you should be making sure that only the columns that are expected are provided, right? So if someone says, if someone provides to you a, a CSV file, and in that CSV file, they tell you there should be 29 columns of data, and you find that there are 28, one of them is missing. You want to figure out which one that is. The next one that we talked about earlier is this thing about datum checks or data checks, in which we're looking for values that are missing from the table unexpectedly. Let's say, for example, we're expecting a completely dense data matrix, something's missing, well, we better find, there, there is a way to automatically check for this. And the final thing that we want to be able to check for are things like statistical checks. So statistical checks include things like the data distribution, the distribution of data, uh, whether there are outliers, whether there are correlations between columns and that sort of thing. So uh, what we're going to go through in the first two portions are schema checks and data checks. And this is stuff that, again, should make a lot of sense does make a lot of sense to people, but people just don't do because they're kind of lazy. And so I'd like to encourage you to get your hands doing it so that in the future, at least you remember that you did it once in this, in this tutorial, you might do it again in a future example. Okay, like I mentioned, they're the roles, the data provider, data analyst, and that schema checks are all about checking the columns of data. Now, I'm only going to show you the simplest case where we check for the columns being present or absent. I'm not gonna show you more complicated things like checking for data types and that sort of thing. So the way that, if you look at the way that statisticians operated back in the day, they were provided with two computer files, computer readable files and human readable files. Sorry, they were provided with two files. One is a human readable file, the other was a computer readable file. The computer readable file was the uh, data matrix and the human readable file was this description of the data. It told the analyst what each column was and had a big description of how that column was described and that's, that's the sort of thing that ought to be provided every time you give data from one person to the other. Um, I think this duplication 
where you have the columns already stated in the CSV file and the columns relisted in a metadata file is really important. Um, basically, it's an implicit contract between you and your data provider. If you have that second metadata file manually curated, particularly if you have it manually curated and not automatically generated from the data file, then that's an independent file that can be used to check for data corruption or data tampering or missing data, all right? So that's why I think having this duplication is actually a case where DRY is a bad idea. Uh, uh, repeat yourself is actually a good thing. So what I'd like you to do, if, uh, what I'd like you to do is take a look at stuff below in the notebook, I'm being cognizant of the fact that you probably have the HTML version open. We're going to go through a data set, which is basically the Boston Economic Indicators data set. It's available online. It's on the Boston Open Data Portal. And it's just got a lot of data, all right? And you'll notice it's got uh, a number of columns, fiscal year, program, account number, fund, amount, et cetera. A little bit of recap of your pandas, if you're not familiar with the package. If you want to get the columns, the list, uh, the item, the num, if you want to get the names of the columns that are present inside the data frame, you can do df.columns. It'll come back with something like that. So a way that I think, now I mentioned a little bit about the schema. And in the case where the schema is just a list of, sorry, the metadata file. In the case where the metadata file is simply a list of columns, then maybe you'd want to not only use a human readable format, but also simultaneously a computer readable format for storing that independent uh, metadata, that metadata independent of the CSV file. So YAML files are a good way to approach that. YAML is, uh, is an acronym which I think stands for YAML Ain't Markup Language. It's sort of a, like PHP, a recursive acronym. Uh, and it's a superset of the JavaScript object notation, JSON file format. Um, it's much more readable than JSON. So I like this. By no means am I trying to say you absolutely have to use YAML. I just think this is, practically speaking, a good way to approach it. The structure of a YAML file is key value pairs, just like JSON, just like dictionaries. That should actually remind you of dictionaries. And so you can have key, uh, a value keyed on a key, or you can have multiple a list of values keyed on a key, and sometimes you can have a subkey keying another value. And so it's a very flexible, also a very flexible file format. So for example, if I have a YAML formatted schema, it might look something like this. So I'll have a key that says file name, and that file name is a string, which is the file name that I'm checking. And this, by the way, will enable you to write other custom code that can automatically loop over YAML files and automatically check the schema. And then after that, you can specify exactly what column names are present as a list under uh, the key column names, all right? So that's the big idea, the basic idea behind what I mean by a human-readable and also a computer-readable YAML format. Now, because YAML can be read as dictionaries, I'm going to show you this down here. You can have the spec. Now, I'm cheating a little bit. I'm just passing in this big, long string. But you can actually read the string file, read the file from, from your disk. Uh, I can have the spec specified as such. I can have the spec specified as such. And if I load the YAML file, uh, sorry, if I load that string into YAML, it will come back with a dictionary, all right? So YAML files basically correspond to dictionaries in Python. And once you have things in dictionaries, well, then it's easier to manipulate and, and use inside some automated workflow. You can also take dictionaries and return YAML formatted text. I'm only showing you this because sometimes you might be the person who's the data provider, and you're generating a column, you're generating data that spans 4,000 columns. At that point, practically speaking, I don't expect you to go and manually write the schema for those 4,000 columns. Maybe it's a better idea to take that list of column names, return it as a YAML formatted thing so that you can pass it on to the data analyst in a downstream thing. But as far as possible, I do want to encourage you, manually curate that YAML file, because that will give you, whether you're the data provider or the data analyst, much more tangible familiarity with the data. It's generally a good thing. 
OK. So we have a YAML file, and we have a CSV file. I want to use the YAML file to check that the spec, the, the metadata spec for the, the column names is exactly what I'm given in the CSV file. How do you guys think that might be accomplished? What tools do we have at our disposal? Volunteers. This is not a trick question. I, okay, I by test, yes. What else do we have? CSV files. What kind of libraries do you make you think of CSV files? CSV. Anything else? Pandas. Okay, when we have so you can use those two packages basically. And then when you have when you have YAML files, we have the YAML package, PyYAML, which I've asked you to install. So we can probably read the CSV file into a pandas data frame, read the YAML file into a dictionary, and iterate over one of those values, the columns or column names key in the dictionary, and check that each one of them is identical. Um, I would like you to give that a shot. So use, the, use your ability to read pandas, read CSV files as pandas data frames, and get the columns. They're all referenced inside the HTML notebooks. Use that, uh, use that information and the example code that I showed you for YAML files, and try to implement this function, this utility function, called schema, check underscore schema, and it should assert that every column in the data frame is present in, some, in that corresponding metadata spec file. So I'd like you to embark on this exercise. Uh, let's give everybody, say, five minutes to get this one done. Spelling error. As I don't want you to get too hung up on the implementation, I'm going to flash up my own implementation. It probably will work, especially if you're on Python 3.6. Basically, the idea is the function signature should accept a generic data frame object and it should accept a metadata column list of column names. That's right. That's a string formatting thing that will accept inside strings variables that were, are in scope. And that's sort of why I'm trying to encourage people to go on to Python 3.6. It's cleaner syntax.
right? Quick check, how many people are okay with implementing this check schema function? Show thumbs, okay. If you're done with that, move on to the next one, which is write the test function. This is not the utility function anymore. This is the test function that will test that particular data file. big has changed. Only the matrix multiplication is the big one for data analytics. So I think the F strings are mostly good, just useful for print and debugging. So I think maybe not, maybe 3.7. Quick check, how many people are done with check schema? Okay. I will talk you through roughly what I'm doing over here. It's a simple for loop. Um, and essentially, I'm iterating over each column name in df.columns. So for call in df.columns, I want to assert that the column is in the metadata columns. All right, and metadata columns is the variable meta underscore columns. And if it's not, if this assertion statement fails, I'll print out the column is not in the metadata column spec. Later on, I've asked you to write a test underscore budget underscore schemas function, and this one explicitly only tests the budget schemas file for metadata correctness. And it should look something like this guy over here. I might want to, for example, implement a read metadata utility function, or I could just simply open up the uh, user with open uh, metadata.yml and then yaml.load from that file. That's also possible. Don't get too hung up on the read metadata thing. It basically reads the metadata YAML spec, and it extracts the columns key from that resulting dictionary, and that gives us gives me the metadata columns, which I pass into the check schema function. You might be now curious about why this architecture. It's another thing that's born out of pragmatism. If I have a bunch of CSV files, it might be good to test uh, each of the CSV files independently as their own thing. Or actually, because we, we're programmers, we got a lot of flexibility, you might actually want to test all of them at one shot. I simply like to organize things by file, for example, and so I'll do one test for one CSV file, and I'll make sure that my, their matching YAML file is tested in a single test function. Yes? So, 
the function that gets called by PyTest has to be named test underscore. So if you want this function to be executed, you have to execute it during the PyTest command. You have to put test underscore before that. The file name also should have test underscore. So I think this might be a good point to recap what PyTest is doing. It's essentially looking through all your .py files and asking which one of them has a test underscore underneath it. It'll go into that and look at all of the functions inside there and ask which one of those have test underscore inside there as well. And it'll execute those, those functions. If I'm not mistaken as well, there's another testing pattern in which you write the function definition at the top of a file and test underscore functions at the bottom. PyTest can also recognize them. I don't like it, but because you know, you're putting the tests together with the functions, it might be nicer or more logical, cleaner, whatever you want to call it, to separate them out into separate files. And which one? Deeper. A debugger. Ah, OK. So what you're doing with PyTest and all automated testing frameworks is essentially saying, writing a contract with yourself and your future self, that this thing should be stable and correct and should work. I want to make sure that if I ever make any changes that might break it, I'll be able to catch it automatically. The debuggers that we see inside IDEs or in Jupyter or whatever, they're sort of the, the place where we're prototyping things and checking to make sure they're correct, not correct. That's, human, that's the human part, human in the loop part of testing. You want to make sure it's correct. Automated testing is, I want to make sure it's stable. All right? And if you go to Itamar's talk, which I think is tomorrow, he'll emphasize this as well. That's right. That's right. Um, my apologies. I didn't put this up inside a notebook, um, so I'll make sure that's updated for the final ver for the post tutorial version that you can archive for your own records. Okay. Cell six. Ah, yes. The the function definition would be very similar to what you see in cell. Number six here, where you say you load the spec, but instead of just loading the string itself, you have to open the file first, and then you have to do with open my file name, and then read that file in as a string, and then load that string into there. So it would look something like, I see people giving me st st uh, stares right now, so it'll look something like this, with open meta data slash underscore file dot YML, R plus as f uh, meta data equals yaml dot load f. That's what that convenience function might look like. All right, but totally, you could actually just put this inside that function, and that would be okay as well. Okay, if you wrote that test and there was a spelling error in the columns, then that test that you just wrote, sorry, if there was a spelling error in the columns and it didn't match up with the spec that was provided independently, you'll get an error that looks something like this. And if you look at the notebooks, you can see it. Uh, if you look at the HTML files, you can see that a bit more clearly. In check schema, uh, this thing called amount is not in the metadata columns. There was a spelling error because someone put an extra space before the capital A. And this is the sort of thing that you can catch if, if it occurs inside the error, if it, if it occurs that there's an incongruency between the metadata spec and the CSV file, all right? And it's this sort of little thing that you'd want to be able to automatically check as you go along with your data analysis projects. OK, um, if you find that error, you can go back and scream to your data provider if your data provider was yourself. If it's someone else, don't scream at them. Now, it's possible to have multiple YAML specs in one file. Again, this matter of organization relates to how complicated your project is. 
I just think it's good to have one, meta, one CSV file, one YAML file, one CSV file, one schema check test, and that sort of thing, all right? So uh, just to get a bit of practice writing YAML specs, I'm going to have you try this out where you write the YAML metadata spec for the Boston economic, uh, oh yes, for the Boston economic indicators file. So it's Boston underscore EI dot CSV. It's in the data file. Uh, it's in the data directory. So go ahead and try making the metadata spec. And if you want to check that your metadata spec was written correctly, you can check it against the existing metadata underscore EI dot YML file. And once you're done with that, I don't want to belabor this part way too much. And in the interest of time, uh, we're going to move on to the datum checks afterwards. So there are a few more exercises in between. I'll leave that for you to go back and try at home. All right? And the datum checks is a, are a bit more interesting. So go try the YAML spec exercise and just leave it at that first. Show that up there, uh, at the, uh, above in the notebook. There, yeah. So I, I can actually, technically speaking, I can take the, I can take the, uh, I can write auto YAML dump for any CSV file, um, and write a function for that, and yeah, that's no problem. <laughs> but I wouldn't do it though. I wouldn't do that, just because I think it's better to have some, someone manually check the data one more time. Auto YAML spec is only good if you have 4,000 columns. If you have only 29 columns, go ahead, just write that one more time. Yeah, but humans make mistakes. So. And if the mistake is made, we can catch it and then have a third person check it. I think it's always better to have more eyes. Practically speaking, better to have more eyes, more mistakes made early, and to catch them rather than automating a lot of stuff that we might then take for granted on the analyst side, for example. So yeah, I think. This is the part, the early upfront part is where it's important to be like human in the loop. Yeah. Really human in the loop, go and look at the data, make sure the spec's written correctly, make sure it's all correct, and only not do it if it's impractical. Yeah. yeah. Okay, quick. Check with uh, thumbs how many people are done with the YAML checks. The YAML spec should be written. I don't intend this again as a very difficult exercise. Just do it, sort of. It's, it's the sort of thing where you just have to do it. If you've done it correctly, essentially it should only have two keys, file name and columns, or something like that, something analogous to that. File name would be boston underscore ei dot csv, columns, and this would indicate, okay, this metadata spec refers to this particular file. Columns would be all of the columns inside that data frame or inside that CSV file. And like I was mentioning, I'd recommend hand curating this thing, either as the analyst or as the data provider. Having more people double checking the data at more steps early on up front is always a better thing rather than having all the mistakes propagate through to the end. All right? Okay. With this, we're going to end a bit of the work for, for just a few minutes about 10 minutes or so, we're going to end some of the live hand-coded portion of this tutorial, move a little bit into 
a walkthrough of some other tools that you'll be able to use for uh, data checks and statistical checks. I intend this to be sort of, I can, I will, I intend this as such. I'll give you a tour through what's available and you can go back to the notebooks and look at exactly how the code is working uh, to do that sort of thing. Um, my intent here is to show you what's possible, all right? So, I'm gonna be structuring this little mini lecture portion as being premised on having a corrupt version of the Boston Economic Indicators CSV file where intentionally I've gone in and deleted two rows of some of the columns of data, all right? So we're gonna have missing data inside there. If I were to read in the data frame, it would look something like that, all right? And just looking at the head and the tail is often a good sanity check that you might wanna do. You might wanna look at the entire data frame, but if you've got a long data frame, pandas in Jupyter will automatically sort of drop out the view from the view, the middle portion. And so we need some tools to help us figure out are there any missing data inside there? We can do something like visual diagnostics. So missing no is a package that's been developed. It's available on PyPy. Um, it's a package that gives you a quick visual view on the completeness of the data, right? And so if we import missing no, we can pass in the data frame into its matrix function and we'll get something that looks like this. And what are we seeing here? We're seeing gray or dark colors wherever the data, a data point is present and white wherever a data point is missing. And in, very quickly, we get a very quick high level overview of, oh crap, I've got missing data. And in the event, under the assumption that I was assuming that this data, data matrix should have been densely populated, this visual check tells me, okay, I need to go back and scream at my data provider. All right, so that's, that's uh, one tool that I think you might want to have inside your toolkit, missing no. Uh, missing data is actually identified as being NAN value. Yeah. It won't, so depending on how you read in the data frame, uh, let's say you know your data pr provider said to you, if there are missing data, it should be encoded as minus 999. Then in that case, you already know that there may be some missing data. In this case, you'd want to know, okay, under which columns do I have those minus 999 values? All right? There's another tool called Pandas Summary. And Pandas Summary will re, uh, imp implements a data frame summary class, which you can use to pass in a data frame DF. And this DF will give you a, a passing in the data frame, passing in data, DF into the data frame summary constructor gives you back, and calling the DFS.summary function gives you back another data frame. But this data frame now summarizes the original data frame that was passed in. So you'll get count, mean, standard, deviation, min, uh, minimum, max, the quartiles, et cetera. The one that's most important for missing data is this row that says missing, right? And it'll indicate how many values are missing inside there. And so with this, you can now start to imagine writing automated tests for are there missing data inside by opening up the data frame, passing it into the data frame summary constructor, and then accessing for every column the missing, sort of missing, the, the value at the row missing, all right? And it would look something like this guy over here, which is exactly what I was uh, telling you about, where over here, we iterate over every column of data, and then we assert that the, at the location, at the row missing for that column, it should have zero uh, it should have a zero recorded there. That, that means that column has no missing data. Then there's a, uh, ah, then there's another check that we can do, which is for that, uh, checks for the range, checks that the range are correct. So we can take again, take, again take advantage of the uh, data frame summary, and we can check that the min value is what we expect, the max value is what we expect, and all of that good stuff. The next portion, where am I here? All right. 
The next portion is on the distribution of data. Uh, and so nothing beats looking for outliers or incorrectly coded values than just looking at the distribution of values that are in, recorded inside there. So how many of you have made histogram plots? Probably everybody has. And how many of you have tried to put multiple histogram plots on a single plot? Kind of not so good of an idea, because sometimes they might overlap or they might have different bin widths. You'll have binning biases and all of that. And so I've worked with Hugo before for a data camp course, and he actually converted me over to using empirical cumulative distributions. Right? And so essentially, you're asking, you're, you're trying to make a plot that looks something like this. Right? And so in the notebooks, you'll have example code of how you can make these plots. So I'm not going to belabor how those plots are made exactly, but I want to convey the point here that if you take a look at this cumulative distribution plot for each of the columns of data, what you'll get is this. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're ordering all of the data points according to their value and then asking what fraction of values belong to, uh, what fraction of values are, are valued below any given particular data point. So, you know, the median is defined as the point that falls such that over here it's at 0 0.5 on the y-axis. And so immediately some things are pretty clear. You've got this zero value here, 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 and here, and there, where I've moused over, and those are clearly outliers from the data. They don't fall close to the distribution of the data. And so this is another thing that's a very good visual check on, oh, do I have something that might be wrong with my data? Low liar outliers will be to the left, bottom left. Uh, high valued outliers will be to the right hand side and I don't know why my browser keeps doing behaving like that. All right, so if you follow the code inside the notebooks, you'll get something that looks like, uh, something that a plot that basically looks like this. We can also, I'm gonna skip these exercises, we can also do stuff where we look at the standardization of the data, where we standardize the data to have mean zero, standard uh, deviation one. Uh, sometimes this is a good thing, sometimes may, this may not be a, an appropriate thing. This over here gives you the CDF for the uh, standardized values. And you can then do a, a, a you can then also do this visual check for, for, for the data post-transformation. Ah, I forgot to mention, you can also check for normality. I think, oh, actually, this, that's going to be talked about later on. So I'm, I'm going to leave that for then. You can check for whether a data, might, a data column might be continuous or not, continuously valued or not. So something like foreclosure deeds, right? This guy, it's numerical. You can plot the cumulative distribution, but it clearly doesn't look like a continuous valued thing. It looks more like a categorical or ordinal or uh, integer valued thing rather than, you know, being comprised of floats. Okay, for categorical type of data, we can make these bar plots as well, and you can make a series of bar plots again using the same matplotlib plotting tricks, and so that's also something useful that I'd like to encourage you to do. Then you might notice, well, okay, this sort of checks on the data. They sort of also fall under the exploratory data analysis phase, and that's absolutely correct. There's this transition point where you go from, okay, are my data complete and are my data files correct and that sort of stuff to, the, to knowing, okay, I've got the certainty that I've written my tests for those. And I can at any time check them and they're stable. And so now I want to go on to sort of like, what do my data look like? And these are some good basic sanity checks on your data that you can perform. Okay. Um, there's this little section at the bottom that's on statistical checks. Like, I was, uh, like some people mentioned at the beginning of the tutorial, you might want to model your data and you might assume that they come from a normal distribution with some mean and standard deviation. And so there are statistical checks that you can see to make sure that it's appropriate for the data that you have. Uh, there are a number of statistical tests. These are not easily, these are things that I don't believe you should be automating, but you should be doing nonetheless uh, with the, at the human in the loop phase of the testing. So the KS test, which I think is pronounced the kolomogorov smirnov test, um, it's a test of equality between two distributions. SciPy stats implements it. Visually, it looks something like this. 
you have one distribution of data in red, that's the CDF, then you have another distribution of data in blue, and you want to know, are these two distributions equal or not? And this is a good way of testing. So you can imagine your red one being the normal distribution, standard normal distribution, or some normal distribution with mean and standard deviation that you've provided. And you want to ask, how deviant is the standard normal distribution or my parameterized, parameterized normal distribution? How different is that from my data? Or how different is my data from that parameterized, parameterized normal distribution? All right. There's an example that I'm showing over here that shows uh, how we can simulate the standard normal distribution uh, and then check that the check to see whether it's uh, similar or well whether it looks like it could have come from the normal distribution or if it looks like it probably came from a different distribution. And if you do a plotting, and you can likewise do the cumulative distribution plots for the normal random normal draws and the uh, data that you have on hand. All right. So these are again nothing deep or nothing uh, too technically difficult, but conceptually simple things that probably we should be incorporating more and more into our data analysis workflows. And I'm hoping the notebooks that you have on hand will give you starter code that you can use to start writing this anything that's more complicated or more uh, relevant to your own projects. Okay. This point, we've ended the main two-hour-ish portion. Uh, we have, I think, 40 minutes left. And I'd like to encourage you to go explore through the bonus notebooks. There's stuff on file integrity. There's stuff on uh, test coverage. And there's stuff on property-based testing. I'd like to encourage you to try those notebooks out. There's other. And if you finish all of them in the 40 minutes, then you're genius. Uh, go ahead, try the projects notebook. Alternatively, if you've got other questions, uh, both Hugo and I are here, and we can, uh, we're happy to lead a, do a discussion with you one-on-one. -on -one, all right? So I'll give you guys until, say, three, uh, four, five, 4 35, and then we'll come back. There's a few last-minute administrative stuff, uh, and then we'll wrap up the tutorial. So please go ahead, go do your own, pick your own adventure sort of thing with the notebooks, the bonus notebooks. And if you have questions, I think this is a great time we can come by and start discussing both philosophical stuff, practical stuff about data testing.